So today, I am going to be playing Tacoma by the Fulbright Company. And then uh, for the second half of this, this session, I will be joined on stage by Fulbright's own Steve Gaynor. And we're going to do a little discussion uh, about the game. Uh, all right, so without further ado, I think we've got everything we need. Uh, let's, let's just play Tacoma. All right, so here I am. I'm on a space station. That's where uh, Tacoma is set. Uh, this is past the, the first part of the game, but it's around where we first meet some other characters. Uh, in order to get to this point, I've already had to agree to a bunch of um, legal documents saying that everything I do on here will be recorded. I've basically found out I'm a contractor. Uh, come to this pretty empty looking space station to try and recover some data. So when I go, go here, uh, there's a bunch of signs saying like, oh, there's going to be an exciting party down this way. I find that uh, there's some data that I can recover from three days ago. So why don't, uh, why don't you guys yell out what you would like me to do? It's for space? Oh, that's a good choice. Oh, some weird words so, appeared in there. You really miss it, huh? Well, it just seems like it'd be strange being back on Earth already after only a year up here. Really? After all I've had to hear from you about the conditions VT has us working under? Yeah, but there's that. And then there's this. Yeah, I, I'll miss it. <laughs> I can't blame you. So, whether you're getting renewed or not, did you submit your yearly crew member report? No. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Yeah, I think I might go get that done. Okay, yeah. I probably should too. Oh my god, wait. Is today obsolescence day? Yeah. Didn't Odin give you a job to do? No. A computer playing favorites. Odin doesn't have a seat. So this is how you experience other people in Tacoma. Uh, you might be familiar with games where you're accessing stories that happened before you got there, uh, whether via diary entries or audio logs, right? Uh, in this case, what we're seeing is augmented reality logs where we have a, uh, a wireframe skeleton of a human being, uh, much like it's used on the Kinect or other motion, motion tracking systems. Uh, you might notice I'm like bobbing my head. That it's, I, I can't stop doing that when I'm maneuvering in zero G. Uh, and I can identify these people when I mouse over them. So this I happen to know is the medic, and I can actually see what her face looks like. But in the actual 3D space of the game, all I see uh, is the skeleton. Uh, so why don't we actually go down to the personnel access area and see, uh, I tried to preload this. This is my favorite part of the game. It really reminds me of Metal Gear Solid 3. Because there's pleasant music playing, much like when uh, Solid Snake was climbing up an endless ladder. And there's just uh, endless rings of color. All right, so now we're going into another area of the space station with normal gravity, because it's not the, the central hub around which everything revolves. So, let's see. Feel free to yell what you think I should do at any time you want. I guess I'm going to open this panel. So that's that's me. I'm playing as Amy Ferrier. So my job is to, to gather this data. It accumulates very slowly. And uh, so the, the, the game actually consists of is you, you sit here and you, you watch this advance. It takes about two hours. And then you, you leave and you go to the next one. And then you eventually get back on your, on your ship. Thanks for coming. 
Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm going to ask Steve later whether you can actually do that, because this, it does continue to advance. Uh, but while you're waiting for it, now these lights have lit up. Um, so I'm, I'm going to make a command decision. We're going to go to administration. But from here on out, definitely, uh, definitely tell me if, if you want me to do something. This one? OK. Going into this conference room. There's no running. Space, OK, we're going to recover some more data. Might be some more glitches. Death sentence. It's creepy. Yearly report to Ventura's Corporation, take three. Uh, Odin, have you got me? I found the cat. Yeah. OK. Uh, House cat. Have my notes up. <clears throat> Can't pet it. Hi there. Just a, just a hologram. Is here, administrator of Lunar Transfer Station, Tacoma. It's been a year now since our crew has cycled onto the station, meaning we've had a year of getting to know each other, getting acclimated to the facility, and getting used to working with our on-station AI. Though working with Odin's been great, hasn't it, Odin? Interact with their desktop? Yes. I think I, uh... uh over here? Oh, oh, you, then you mean this the thing? Lunar Resort yeah, and yeah, you can, uh, you can snoop files this way. Now, now everything's paused, but uh, I have a corporate report script. Yeah. Anyone want to? Should we? Should I try to investigate one of these? Okay. Let's let's just click on them and see. Okay. About the uh, the obsolescence day party instructions. Obsolescence day, by the way, is a, is a great holiday. It's a celebration of the future uh, when um, everything has become completely automated by by AIs and machines, but a law is passed to sort of allow human beings to still work, and that's obsolescence day commemorates that. Oh, that one's corrupted. And uh, oh yeah, Tacoma, Washington, namesake of this this game and the space station it's on. Lawsuits. All right. By almost four percent, though most of that is thanks to Odin finding some improvements we could make. Uh, the what? Uh, our proudest moment as a crew, I think, the was coffee? when a resort guest needed emergency oh, care bag. while on a transit vessel. And I'm not sure. Should we allow Tacoma Steve Gaynor to, to, uh, in one to of give our commands? Cryo beds until she you might, a lot of the objects uh, in this game uh, have right there. Uh, a Southeast Asian Odin, language we'll flavor. We'll the party, okay? Um, oh, I'll do the famous put back, put back. Uh, and now, oh, I didn't get the code to so be able to go through that door. Rewind, OK, I'm rewinding. Pay attention. I'm, it's really hard with you people around. OK, so uh, I have rewound the, the record and found out that to get into this office, I can press 1128. Or, oops, 284. No, it's a four. Um, I guess I have to rewind again. Oh, 1228. Oops. All right, so now I have access to. I just hang out in here. What do you guys want me to do? Press C. Okay. Run, chaser. Okay. Um, but they said. That Wait, um, so there's no oxygen on the station except what we're breathing right now? Correct. Additionally, how long does that get us? Jesus, how much shit hit us? No, I, I'm trying other Maybe. AR channels. If Odin's readings are correct. Nope. Or Nothing. I'll have VT send up a fresh supply straight away. Uh, guys, it might not be that easy. Additionally, external communications have been lost. Jesus. So we've got no air supply, no external comms, no way to call for help. Well, anybody got any bright ideas? Okay, so that's the end of that recording. Uh, there, this is the whole crew, by the way. They all have different colors, and um, I thought you, it makes it easy to keep track of them. I'm in the kitchen now, and I guess this is the obsolescence day party. I know someone said fix fix the sign. Uh, that, that might take a little while, but I can at least uh, demonstrate the use of put back to, to fix the sign. I'm not going to do the whole thing. Any, anyone else have requests? You want to fix the whole sign? 
Wow, this is this is what they call a game crowd. Just just you guys just want the achievement, don't you? You want to see the achievement pop? Well, I have news for you. I already got the achievement on this account. Fine. I, I see. I even know where the last one is. It's here in the bathroom. Uh. Oh wait, I'm missing an E. Wait, I where? Oh, up there. No. Oh, on the ground. Okay, that's easy. Happy obsolescence day, Tacoma crew. No achievement. I already have it. So I could, at this point, you know, I could restart the the whole recording, right? I can just they'll all rewind. I can go listen to the guys in the kitchen, for instance, if, if I want to. So the name Obsolescence Day, it's more like a joke. <laughs> you could say it's facetious. Kai, you probably think I'm an idiot for never even thinking about why it's called that. Out of curiosity, why did yeah, you think we were celebrating? Special. It's unprecedented. I thought maybe it was it when some old type of AI you know, had become obsolete. But well, I guess that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Uh, no, um, AI aren't like designer hardware. As soon as the new model's out, you trade in the old one for customer loyalty. AI are more like um, mighty redwoods. Ancient organisms growing and adapting year up. So here's uh, some instructions from the AI. Uh, as part of the obsolescence day celebration, the AI has just told all of the, the crew members what to do using the crew members as its hands. It's the other way around. Get it? It's like... That's why it's so fun for Elvis Lessons Day. So I guess this is, um, oh yeah, this is the instructions for making the cake, which was the, this crew member's job. That one's corrupt. Oh, a note from a friend saying like, oh yeah, this is, this is like a cat small style note. Like, no, don't make that bad relationship choice. Um, okay. Year, decade after decade. How do you think this looks? So we can't huh. see uh, um, the cake, interestingly, is invisible. Sorry, this is what Odin wanted? It, uh, Odin, uh, this is what you wanted, isn't it? That is a fairly accurate representation of my instructions. See, he loves it. Thank you, Odin, that'll be all. Yeah, but we're the ones who have to eat it. Well then, no need to keep the good people waiting, eh? Evie, we're about to cut the cake. Ah, great. Um, be right there. Here it is, Odin's masterpiece. Sarah, come on up, it's ready. Gather round, gather round, everyone. As per obsolescence day tradition, tonight's festivities have been planned entirely by our all-knowing, all-seeing computer companion, Odin. He provided specifications for the uh, cake, uh, the decor. We humans only did the grunt work in his grand plan. And so for your enjoyment tonight... Oh. Oh. Odin, what was that? Debris has... I have right at the station's orbit. Meeting from? Um, but they said that... Um, no, I'm, I'm not getting an outside data connection. Right now. Correct. But look... Here's Cluey Dog, who's on another place called the uh, Tangier Sovereign Platform. Oh, uh, body pillows, important addition to the game, with uh, this character's double husbandos. Um, yeah, and more party instructions. So I think uh, I, I just wanted to demo for you guys how the, the interaction and conversation systems work. Uh, there are often multiple things going on at once. You need to <laughs> rewind um, in order to, to see various things or to sort of uh, snoop through all of these documents. Um, but what I really want to talk about before we invite Steve up on stage is the relationship between Tacoma and uh, the, you know, it's, it's, it's the elephant in the room, I guess. Uh, that I, who, who said that came up right, right before this, this talk started? Rami? Or someone was like, oh, is this where I hear about uh, Gone Home in Space? Because uh, just as, as I had uh, a, a bad relationship to some math teachers of mine because they gave my, my little sister a hard time when she took the same math classes as I did and then they were like, how come you're not as smart 
as, as your older sister. Um, Tacoma is sort of, I, I wouldn't say living in the shadow, but it's constantly uh, being compared to Gone Home uh, in the press and elsewhere. Uh, maybe to no small consternation of the Fulbright team, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. But I, I thought it would be useful to, to try to take this seriously, not just be like, oh, it's, it's like going home and not really look into it. I actually think in, in the details are some of the most interesting uh, co comparisons. Those the sort of family resemblances, you know, the, the cast of a nose or the way that you laugh that might be a little bit like your, your older sibling. Uh, and especially because now that there are two games by Fulbright, we can say like, oh, there's a certain style, there's a certain uh, set of motifs. We can understand this is a body of work uh, that's kind of richer than just looking at something by itself. Uh, so in, in both of these games, you kind of start off by having to assert like, okay, I have the right to enter this space. Uh, in Tacoma, you have to sort of sign this contractor agreement. And in uh, Gone Home, you have to look underneath the Christmas duck, which is, of course, where the family has, has, has left the key for you to go into uh, their house. And you quickly learn, maybe from sort of looking in your inventory, something you can also kind of do in Tacoma in a more virtual way, uh, that your identity is of somebody who's supposed to be here. Uh, in Gone Homes, because you're, you're a member of the family, uh, and I should mention, yeah, there are references in Tacoma to Gone Home, probably the, the most overt of which is that there's also a Christmas duck, and this time you can turn it on. Um, Another thing uh, is that they both have this the put back system, which is uh, curiously hasn't I haven't seen adopted by too many high end uh, 3D games. The interesting thing about this system is that it was kind of novel when it was introduced in Gone Home, and uh, people said, "Oh, is this kind of a commentary about the the main character, Katie? Is she sort of fussy? Uh, does she not really feel like part of this family? Does she sort of put everything back like she's a, a burglar?" Um, but I think it's also just keeps everything from becoming a huge mess which it's, a, it's an interesting uh, design choice and a reflection on the character. In the case of Tacoma, it is, it's a little bit more like you, you are actually going through these strangers' living space. So if you pick up a toothbrush, you're in somebody else's house. I hope you don't do this when you go over to, to your friend's houses. But you sh if you do, you should put the toothbrush back exactly where you found it so that nobody knows what you were doing. Uh, and... In the process, uh, in both of these games, we don't actually see 3D models that are attempting to be lifelike, right? Uh, instead, we have photographic representations of people. Uh, the mother and uh, the main character that you play uh, in Gone Home on the right, and uh, in a virtual version, you have all of these ID, uh, ID cards, totally different, actually, from each other. This is an international crew, and you, there's a lot of interesting world building in the... Uh, in these sort of ID cards of, of Tacoma. And this is how you get a sense of who you're seeing as these, as these uh, wireframe skeletons moving around in the space. And then you, you snoop around in their documents, you read uh, their letters about past failures and how they're dealing with it, and you, you get sort of uncomfortably close uh, to their, the, the details of their life in a way that's not, uh, not maybe necessarily really part of what you're trying to do there. Uh, in Gone Home, you're just trying to figure out where your family is ostensibly. In a Tacoma, you're there to retrieve specific data, but you end up pawing through a lot of other stuff uh, for, for reasons that maybe have more to do with the player than the character. But the character does assert themselves sometimes. And it's like, enough is enough. And that happens when the, the character gets too close to lesbian sex in both games. So in Gone Home, uh, the main character kind of refuses to read this explicit diary entry about her, her, her younger sister's first time with her girlfriend. Uh, and in Tacoma, there's actually, I was very surprised to find a, a, a callback to that. There's a box with some rope and uh, a sex toy in the, the chamber, uh, the living chambers of the two women who are in a relationship. And uh, the main character just is like, I'm, I'm not picking that one up or putting it back. It's not touching it at all. Uh, and yeah, so there's a there's a, a definite motif here, right? Uh, the the lesbians in both games, you're you're sort of scared for both of them, um, or all yeah for all four of them at various times. So in Gone Home, uh, there was this famous scene where you go to the bathtub and there's it's splattered with red stuff, and you suddenly think, oh no, did the little sister commit suicide? Uh, and it turns out it's, it's like manic panic red or something, right? Uh, it's hair dye. You're not sure. There's suspense about what happens with the relationship. And there's a, a kind of similar motif happening in Tacoma with the two characters who you're following their story, the, the engineer and the, and the hacker. Uh, you're not sure whether they're going to survive. The hacker has a, has a bad heart murmur. 
Um, and then, and then they, there's an accident sort of later on where you're, you're not sure whether they survived that. So it's a, there's a lot of, uh, of heartstring pulling here. And uh, I remember when Gone Home came out, there was, a, there was some commentary that this was uh, kind of both a, an echo of and a subversion of a, a very old trope. Um, that's, I think, specifically uh, lesbian death syndrome, I think someone, some people call it. Goes all the way back to, uh, I think the most, most famous early example is this this film, um, The Fox, where uh, these two women get into a relationship. Uh, the the husband of the woman on the right comes comes back from war and is shocked to find that that this woman uh, is in a relationship with another woman. Uh, but then, fortunately for that heterosexual relationship, a tree literally falls on the blonde woman. And out of nowhere, and then the husband's like, stay back. I don't want you touching your dead lover's corpse. Um, and so that was sort of a, you know, one of the seminal works that kicked off this idea of like, why are you just killing lesbians randomly? And it's still something that people critique today. Uh, and interestingly, both Gone Home and Tacoma sort of like raise, raise this specter and then dissolve it. I am, I'm spoiling things a little bit. If you were here last session, you know that I'm, I'm pro-spoilers. I'm giving you guys partial spoilers about what you might encounter. Uh, also because there's some subversion here of, of, trope, of tropes and ideas from genres that came before. So if, if, you, if you say, like, what, what genres do these games purport to be? Uh, Gone Home has at times been, been accused or described as uh, sort of echoing some ideas or creating the mood of a... 20th century horror film or haunted house film, like something like the Amityville Horror. Like, are you stepping into a space of the supernatural? Are there ghosts in this house? It, you know, it turns out those ghosts are more metaphorical and psychological than, uh, than sort of literally supernatural. Uh, so it sort of maybe sets you up to, to think something might be going on and then tells a rather different kind of story that's about coming of age and coming out. Uh, if Tacoma has a correspondence, I think it's probably 2001, A Space Odyssey, kind of sets up some ideas that like, oh, or this, is this AI that you saw sort of giving directions for a party, is it, is it sinister? Is it what caused this accident? And then, you know, I won't re reveal too much, but I'll give you some structure for maybe appreciating this game better by saying, no, actually there's a more interesting story that's told there than a rehash of the relationship between humanity and hell in, in 2001. Uh, but most, most importantly, I, I wanted to mention this, this similarity. So in going home, if you shoot a basket with a basketball from the garage, you get to watch this video of a cat. Uh, this, is, this is Mitten's journal entry from Gone Home. And so you, you get to hear the thoughts of Mittens, the family cat, who, who is actually less present in Gone Home than the, the cat in Tacoma is, like hanging out in various places. Watch. <laughs> that cat voice actor, I tell you, that's amazing work. Uh, and then I have to show you, the amazing thing is that th this hasn't really been captured. I think there's only one video of this online, and it's not great, so I made, I made one for you. This is what happens if you play uh, a game of basketball in Tacoma by bringing an object all the way across the space station and, and using it. In this case, it's a skull, which I really appreciated because uh, I, I'm, I'm the daughter of a microbiologist and we had an actual human skull that we played with when I was a child. The colors of those cats are the same colors as the colors of the crew members, by the way, if you didn't notice. And then they, they flow out of the space station towards the distant moon. So uh, that's the, uh, yeah, I want to give a, a whole Fulbright team a round of applause for that because I feel like we've seen the future of humanity and cats. It's a, this is a, I don't know if it's the cat child or the star cat, one of those, one of those two, um, just like Kubrick. But, but less pretentious. Um, it's, it's full of cats, exactly. Oh, yeah, and with that, I, I would like to invite Steve Gaynor up to chat a little bit uh, about Tacoma. 
Hey. Thanks for uh, that thoughtful walkthrough of <laughs> so much of the stuff in the game. That was really cool. Though. Sure thing. So yeah. um, we were actually talking about spoilers here last session. Do, yeah. you, do you feel like I gave too much away about what, what happens in the game? I don't think so. I think if you're in this audience, you're, you're probably like okay to be spoiled. Yeah, I know some people like ran out of the room <laughs> because they were like, I, I know you're going to spoil everything, Naomi. Um, yeah. I, what I, I, I feel like there always are these interesting twists that you guys are doing in, in both of these games and also subversions of genre. Is that you know, just uh, something that you, you're interested in that you want to kind of continue as a motif? Like, what's the deal? Well, I don't know. I, I, I guess from my perspective, uh, I don't have a lot of, I don't think super far ahead as far as that stuff goes. So, like, I, I think that um, some of the stuff in the game and, and it actually some of the things about, like, what you were noting about the things that the characters are like, nope, I'm, I'm backing off from that, had, like, more similarities to them than I had realized. And I think that some of that, when you point it, like, you start from a genre thing and then try to work against it. It's almost more of it's kind of how we can't help addressing those things when we get ourselves into the situations, you know? So it's like when you start with the spooky house at night, we have to figure out how to try to make it not just be the thing that you're expecting. And similarly, we're like, we're going to make a space station game. We're going to put these kind of like ghostly, you know, characters in the space. So there's going to be an AI. And now we have to say, OK, abandoned space station, AI, we know what everybody's thinking. We know what we're thinking. So how do we get to a more interesting place than that by the end? All right, it makes me wonder whether there are folks out there who would do something that was closer to an homage. Like, right. I want to be just like Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> but it's going to be more awesome. It's, right. We're going to update to uh, HD 4K, <laughs> this sort of monolith sequence. Right. From, uh, and, and then you're going to be able to look around it in VR. Whoa, yeah. VR monolith. Yeah. And then you just you start evolving. Right, so I mean, the I, I feel like that's the other route, right? Rather sure. than saying like, oh, well, let's, let's mix it up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know, there is definitely a lot of room for loving homage and like kind of having a shared set of things that we all kind of love and we get to be, look, it's all the things that we love, which mm -hmm. there's some of in our games, certainly. I mean, you know, like stuff like putting the X-Files in Gone Home is not purely, that was in the 90s. It's also, we love this, probably other people do. Um, uh, but, but then, you know, I think that for us, we want to be able to have people say that they feel like once they've played one of our games that that it isn't just something that they've already seen before but remixed or you know put right. with a different coat of paint you know and so uh i have to ask so how are you feeling about all of the uh, the the gone home tacoma comparison i just did and oh, yeah uh, i know that's come up some in the press too yeah i mean it's it's well i i think that part of it that's really interesting is when you work really close to something there can be parallels that you're not even aware of until after other people's perception kind of point them out to you and you're like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> like that is more similar or that does have more in common or kind of come from a sim uh, uh, you know, the same place that isn't as conscious during the process because it's just kind of your tool set. You're like, oh yeah, we do this when, when we're in the situation. I think that like the, the it, it's, it's inevitable and honestly it's like you can't, you can't ask for kind of a higher compliment, I guess, than for everybody to say, like, Gone Home was, like, you know, important or, like, that, that you know, everybody knows about this game and that's your starting point and now we're going to compare the new thing to that, right? Like, it could very much more be, like, nobody's ever heard of our first game. Like, I would much rather have this thing that kind of is the, the lens um, than the other side. And at that point, you just have to kind of be there for people saying, like, I'm starting from your first work and I'm putting these things side by side and I'm judging them kind of more in tandem than either one on its own at that point. Right, oh, or yeah, as a set, right? Yeah. And then maybe when you get to the third or fourth one, there are people who will be like, oh, well, you know, everyone knows Gone Home. <laughs> that was this sort of like their their big, uh, the breakout sure. first one, yeah. right? But then, but you know, Tacoma is actually my favorite, right? There's going to be people who <laughs> right. yes. who argue about that, and that's that's maybe sort no, of a lovely thing to No, I mean it's like spark. it's the 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 highest compliment version of that you can get is that you know people have like tweeted us like I think I actually like Tacoma more than Gone Home, which within that is like the assumption that like Gone Home's good. So you know it's like yeah. you know you 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 have to be appreciative 
even when also you probably on some level you're like, well, I wish that people could just like see this thing for itself, right. but that's impossible. You know, when you're making your second album, when you're releasing your second film or novel or who, anybody, it can't just be its own. Some thing. people say uh, compare this to having kids. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Child, I don't know first you, child thing. Yeah, like. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense. I never. You don't. Do you, you don't have any kids? Uh, I don't have kids, and yeah. I'm an only child. So. So it's uh, hard for you to make that. Uh, well, but the, well, the funny thing is, when you yeah. said the um, the the thing about your sister being in the same class as mm -hmm. you afterwards, that was actually. So my wife has three siblings, and she's the oldest. So me being around them when they were growing up, there was exactly that would go on. Like, her younger siblings would be like, oh, this teacher's such like, an asshole. Marsha, they're, Marsha, they're, Marsha. <laughs> they're always talking about, oh, your, your older sister was in my class. And so I tried to put some of that in Gone Home mm -hmm. because I was like, all oh, right, right, that's a sibling thing. Um, but yeah, I think it is sort of that similar kind of like feeling of, of sort of like, you know, Tacoma is the second child. Hopefully, like, the middle child <laughs> in the longer term, you know? Right, yeah. Um, and, and seeing that build out to a bigger picture is like interesting from our perspective as well. Right, so you have some some motifs which I guess were really clearly uh, repeated like the cat like the cat right. basketball yeah. thing and then others which maybe you though are more just part of the process right or even unconscious uh, and so now that they're both, both games are out and you, you people like me are pointing them out does that make you feel like oh we got to we have to subvert that expectation too. We're, we're not going to do it again a, a third time. Or, or is it, or is it a house style? Is there? Yeah. Any... Well, I don't know. I mean, like, a. I think it's going to be a little while before we want to make something that is like directly in this design space mm -hmm. again. Um, you know, because like Tacoma followed fairly directly on after Gone Home, and I think that they do kind of work as a set. And I don't really know what you know like i don't have like a 10-year plan or like here we're right. doing this and this and this or but so I, you haven't conceived a triptych right yeah. <laughs> well i mean so honestly in a way um carla so my co-founder mm -hmm. at fulbright carla zamanja um we do all the story stuff at the at the studio together and we first worked together on minerva's den which was a dlc for bioshock 2. awesome ah, um, there is a triptych in in well i mean honestly so here's the so in, <laughs> I'm going to go deep in the lore here. So um, the AI in Tacoma um, is named Odin, and the voice actor is Carl Lumbly, who um, is a, a great voice actor. He's done screen and, and television stuff. So he was also the voice of the creator of the AI in Minerva's Den. Um, and then the main character, um, Amy, uh, is played by Sarah Grayson, who was the voice of... Sam in Gone Home. And oh, so right. now in Tacoma, it's like the voice of our main character from our first thing we worked on together, getting to actually meet <laughs> the voice from our second game and kind of like close that loop. So it's possible that I think for us, you know, and the whole like AI thing and, you know, like. And the names of the AIs, like there's a, there are a couple AIs actually in, right. in Gone Home, including. Well, the, the one at the end of Tacoma. Her there were no AIs in Gone. Oh, sorry, not in Gone. <laughs> yeah, in Tacoma. Uh, is Hera is the. Uh, there's Heka. Oh, there's, Heka, um, right. Yeah, yeah they're, they're all like deity right. names, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that for us, you know, looking at Carla and I working together and a lot of the themes, you know, um, that kind of started with the Nervous Den and now here, this kind of feels like I think we've worked through our current, like, you know, perspective on that kind of space. I think we're going to do some things, to get back to the point, that won't be so easily directly compared, not as a reaction to the direct comparison, but for us being like, OK, we need to like explore some different space for a while and then maybe come back to Right, so it's kind it's of kind of actually compl it's complete with those three. And, and you know, I think that we're at a point where like, if we were going to keep working with this kind of stuff very directly, I feel like we would need to have like a lot more to say right. now. And it's sort of like when we've been working in this space effectively for, I mean, Carla and I worked on Minerva's Den in 2009. So like, you know, eight years. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's probably a good time to say, let's like recharge our perspective and start thinking about this stuff differently if we're going to come back to it, you know. And that's a good note. So uh, all of the uh, um, budding academics and game studies grad students out there, uh, it's a, it is a triptych, <laughs> and it starts with the nervous den. If you're going to analyze well, and there's, the, there's the super, full work, well, there's like um, the the through line for that is the video game, um, the the game in the game Spitfire, 
was from a nervous den, mm -hmm. and it, there's a Super Nintendo cartridge of it in Gone Home, and then it's an AR game in Tacoma. So oh, like, right. okay, it's yeah. there. That's, uh, yeah, so that, I missed that one completely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's too, too deep for me, but uh, are there, are there, is there cat meowing in Minerva's Den? Uh, so in every level in Minerva's Den, you can find, because it's Rapture, a, a tragically, you know, dead city under the sea, you can find a dead cat in each of the levels oh. that, has a, that has a unique name that's named after, like, a pioneering uh, computer scientist oh, or right. mathematician. Okay. Yeah, I think um, I remember this. Yeah. So, so finding a cat in every level is also a thing we've done before. Well, that's, that's great. I'm really glad, glad that we went from the dead cats to the sort of everyday life of cats to the, the godlike future yeah, of cats. Yeah. Okay. It's a great movement. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of want to throw it open to see if anybody else had questions that they wanted to ask uh, on this topic or others. Yeah, you're, you're being brought a mic. <laughs> um, so Gone Home has obviously been, I don't know, I don't know if, how familiar you are with that, but... Um, I mean, I've heard uh, of it. <laughs> in the VR community, it's kind of oh. seen as a progenitor for working in terms of spatialized relationships to environments, right, cool. in an embodied kind of way. Um, and have you, I mean, how are you thinking about that? And even when you did Gone Home, did you think about, were you thinking at all about VR at that point? Or is it all incidental that that kind of, well, took that path. Yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't a starting point, right? Like when we were making Gone Home, we weren't like this is also like a VR thing. At like actually the first Oculus dev kits got sent out like during Gone Home's development, I think. And like we did try pulling some stuff across and like, you know, just seeing how it slots in. And the thing that we discovered is for a fully um like you're saying, a fully embodied uh, 3D game in VR, you need a lot of things that, like, by default, you don't need for like a PC or console game. So you can't have like uh, UI that's just stuck to your HUD. It has to like have depth, and you need to have like a player body to orient to. And so I think the answer is that it was enough rework to like make it work well in VR at the time that we started working on it. Um, that it was never enough of a priority that we were like. Let's do that version. But something that's been really interesting is that in the intervening time, there's been a lot of other people that have found other ways to represent that kind of like being in a space through VR that didn't exist when like the Oculus DK1 was uh, showing up on people's doorsteps. So like I think Gone Home is a kind of game that could work really well with like point to point movement and then examine things near you. And that kind of like takes some of the overhead of like you need this and this and this kind of uh, stuff out of the out of the equation, but it's all totally theoretical. This is not stuff that we're like doing. I think if anything, it's really, um, it's cool that, I don't know, I, I, I think of Gone Home, it, it's great to see that game be an inspiration for like different, you know, things that the people are doing and it also being like a touchstone for the VR development community is like, I don't know, that, that's really cool to, to know about. Any other questions? Yeah, we've got one in the middle. The man in the good shirt. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, I was just uh, curious. Um, Gone Home is a very personal story uh, following this family. And obviously, the Tacoma crew is the analog for the Greenbriars. But it's also science fiction. And when you were first plotting out Tacoma, was the world building a your like ground zero or was it the story of the crew um because they're both very compelling in this game as well that's a good question um i think that in in a lot of ways the the world building kind of drove the um a lot of the identity of like what happens um you know i think that our starting point was saying okay we want to like do something that's set in the future we need like an isolated environment that you're kind of like stuck in let's put the player on a space station and then the and then we're like I, you know like it's you know 75 years from now so it's not like 500 years from now it's not 20 years from now like it has a good midpoint of speculative fiction being able to project a little ways and so then at that point we we're like why does a space station exist in 2088 and you know we we're looking at like uh spacex you know like the commercialization of space is probably like a for-profit uh, uh enterprise and so, okay, who are, like, what kind of people would be working in this, like, job? Who would be here? Why would they be here? And then, like, 
what happens to them. And I think that a lot of that was our starting point for why so much of the fiction ends up about being like corporate overreach and people being stuck in the economics of kind of being subcontractors to this giant, you know, unknowable um, thing that they're in the middle of and continuing then to build forward to like, who are they specifically and, and what exactly is going on in, in the plot. Um, yeah. I'm really glad that you asked that because that, that was actually the other burning curiosity that I had uh, was about the world building, especially so the crew is really multinational. They all have ID from, issued by different governments, which kind of, I think, I guess speaks to the idea that it's a, a like a corporate effort to like draw people from all over the world. I mean, many of them are different. Uh, many of them are subsets of what the United States used to be. Yeah, so I, I noticed that there's like Pacifica. Were you influenced by that? Um, so there's a famous book where the U.S. is split into sort of seven nations, and one of them. Yeah, is, uh, I, um, I, I know what you're talking about, and yeah. we looked at it early, but um, I haven't, I haven't read it. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, you know, there, um, there's definitely, there's, we tried to imply some ideas of like splintering and reforming throughout the the world, like, um, and you know, honestly, like, there, there's, there's. There's a couple of layers of, I think, the tone of Tacoma. And I think in the foreground, it's a, it's a, it's a suspense story. It's a disaster story. And it, at the end, spoilers, it has sort of like a hopeful note at the end, right? Um, so, so I think foreground, it's not really like grim, dark, like, you know, heavy. But the deeper you dig into the background stuff, the kind of grimmer it is. It's, yeah, it's a little bit of a cyberpunk dystopia when you sort of look at the world building. A little, yeah, you know, because like, what what we wanted to do was say that if this game takes place in 2088, then like a lot of things shouldn't just be the same as they are, right? Like things change fast and, and the world staying static is not uh, believable. And so yeah, some of that is some nations have been split into smaller nations and like there's a couple of places where it's mentioned like on Clive's ID that you showed. Um, he hails from the USSR EU, um, which is like, and, and also their unit of currency is the Euruble. That's like <laughs> sort of national. Um, yeah. and, and so we were like, okay, some you know, uh, countries are splitting apart, but like there's this implication that Russia started taking in more states again at some point, and you don't really know why, um, but it is maybe not like the sunniest outlook on where geopolitics might go. And it is a little bit of a story puzzle. You're sort of trying to put it together. Uh, and I, I have to admit, I found that quite absorbing. I, I tried yeah. to do the crossword that's in yeah. one section of the game. Just was like, oh, so these, this crossword has some real answers. The crossword is kind of the like uh, uh, Rosetta Stone in a, in a way as far as yeah. like how, how much of our fiction we're explicit about, but yeah. Right, I, I couldn't figure out all the answers. I was like, oh man, there's clearly a bunch of world building here. Yeah. Uh, and I could not also not figure out, so the, the head of the com of company is in Italy. Well, he, or, or is yeah, Italian. he's an Italian family, yeah. Uh, and there's one headquarters in Italy, which I think is where the HECA AI is. And right. Then, yeah, it's like a corporate strategic AI. Right. And then, but then the main operations are in Singapore, right. which is why all of these supplies that they have are in various like Southeast Asian languages, and there's a bunch of Japanese imported stuff right. too. Um, where, what's the connection there? Is it just like that happened to be where it was useful for this multinational corporation to set up like an orbital launch? No. So that. So that's. So kind of to your question. Um, Similarly, that came from like research and world building first. Like we wanted to, if we were going to do a space elevator and a space station and all this stuff to like do the physics research to say like, how would this plausibly work? And then we get to have a little bit of technology black box to say they've made better tech so you can actually do it and then it's there, right? But um, for a space elevator to be on Earth, it has to be on the equator. Right, okay. Um, because as it turns basically, there's an anchor on the Earth and then there's the, the spaceport which is in low Earth orbit and they're basically pulling on each other and, and keeping it stable. But if you were to put it further north or south, it the, anyway, um, so from that point, we were like, okay, it has to be on the equator. What are our options for like major, you know, like commercial centers that could potentially be the base for this? And our pick was Singapore, which is a a um, it's a it's a city state nation, so it's a country and a city uh, entirely. Um, so it felt like okay, 
this is the kind of place where like the government of Singapore could be like that we've unilater unilaterally decided to sell off a bunch of our land to put a space you know elevator on because it's going to be good for our economy and then also it's historically like a shipping hub um, and so it it, it it made sense but it came from like how would this work now what can our version of that be and then they're advertising all the advertising that they're doing inside of Tacoma is all sort of pitched at um, like East Asian and Southeast Asian customers. Yeah, a lot of it is, um, yeah, Indian right. and yeah, um, Southeast South Asian. Asian yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought that was that was great. Uh, very thoughtful world building, even compared to sort of big famous franchises like uh, uh, Firefly. I think famously has all this like, oh, we're going to put all this Asian flavor into the products and stuff. And then there are, there are like there's there's like one minor Asian character as one line in the whole show. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's never really quite explained, or there doesn't seem to be that much thought behind it. Behind right. Joss Whedon being like, oh, you know what's going to be big in the future? China. You know. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, all right. Do we have any other questions? And and how are we doing on time? Um, it looks like we probably have time for like one. Yeah, or, I think we have one or, more question. Or two more, maybe. If maybe short. two. Um, so what was the initial seed for the rewind mechanic and um, when did you realize that it was going to be effective as like one of your core storytelling mechanics and uh, what challenges did you actually face either implementing it or uh, getting it to work the way that you were initially intending? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so you're here from, from New York City. Yep. Um, so I imagine that as a person in that space in New York that you've gone to sleep no more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Sleep No More is an immersive theater production in New York where it takes place on multiple floors of this converted hotel and the performers are going through this space that's shared with the audience. And so you can follow the, the performers around and see them do scenes and they split off and you have to choose which person you're going to follow. Um, and so uh, a bunch of us uh, went to Sleep No More. Uh, I first went there when I was working on Bioshock Infinite because I was in Boston and New York is close by and then we went again and that was something that felt very game-like in a physical space in a way that's like very unique. Um, and so starting, you know, when we were like, okay, we have these characters, you know, that are in the world with you but you can't interact with them, it felt like we could expand that out to, to be like a sleep no more like experience where there's a lot going on and you have to kind of you know choose what you're focusing on at any point in sleep no more the each evening is three hours but the production is only an hour so it loops three times and you can follow it on successive loops but for us we were like in both the game fiction and in reality it's a digital thing so we can say we will have that same kind of you follow one thing you go back and connect the pieces, but like in fiction as part of like how this technology works. Um, and the point where we realized that it was like what we needed to invest in was we just like, we had some AR scenes that were like smaller and more isolated and you could just like click to watch them and they played through and then you could watch them again if you want. And we just asked our programmer to just hack in scrubbing back and forth and as soon as we could like rewind, we were like, all right, we can use this, like this is what the game has to be about. Yeah, so it's one of the most user-friendly, I think, uh, designs for a multiple events happening simultaneously in a sort of simula in a simulated space. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, for me, I wouldn't want to play the version of the game where like you go in and you follow one character and then it ends and then you have to like you have to play start the whole a new game, game to see another angle. Yeah, uh, Deadline is the classic example of that from the '80s, the interactive mm -hmm. fiction game. Yeah. Where in order to solve the mystery, you have to like follow like eight different characters around and yeah. to either save, reload endlessly. To, right. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, from our perspective, it's like I would I would rather the player have tools to find all the detail they're interested in. You know, with the time that they invest, um, and so yeah, it, it's good that it something that, something that um, as far as you saying it being user friendly, like it's a relatively I think when you like put it down on paper, complicated mm -hmm. set of requirements to understand how to interact with that thing, and it's one of the things in the game that we just never tutorialize. We just put the controls on screen, and you know what you know YouTube controls look like, and people are like, oh, I get it. If I rewind it, I can see where the other guy went. And then you just go. And so that's something that um, that has been, I think, um, really great for us to see is how people could just kind of like get that in, in, a, in a natural way, even though I think it's not something that you see in a lot of games. Yeah. 
That's the, yeah, that's fantastic. So you put it out there, and it's you t when you watch people play it for the first time, it's generally just they pick it up. Yeah, I mean, as far as things that people like get hung up on, I don't think I've ever seen it be like understanding the implications of this rewind fast forward thing and how to use it, which is, you know, cool. It's, it's good the, to see. the usefulness of uh, very standardized interfaces <laughs> and yeah. relying on things people already know.